Good afternoon. I'm David Axelrod, the founding director of the Institute of Politics. And I welcome you on behalf of our partners at the Harris School of Public Policy and the Crime Lab uh, to today's forum. We're here today because this scourge of crime and violence has touched too many of our neighbors and our neighborhoods. More than 4,000 people murdered in the past eight years alone, 17,000 people wounded, many of them children, uh, kids in our neighborhoods uh, here on the south side of Chicago. One of the candidates you'll hear from uh, today, and they'll be here back to back, will have the responsibility to try and stem that tide of violence. We've invited people to join them on this stage who are steeped in this issue and uh, will engage the candidates. And our hope is that uh, through this forum, we'll generate more light than heat uh, and give you and all those who watch on the live stream uh, of, this, of this program a clearer sense of where and how these women will lead. So let me just give you a sense of how this is going to go in just a moment. I'll hand over the mic to Jens Ludwig, the director of U Chicago's uh, Crime Lab, for an overview of the public safety challenge facing our city. And this presentation has been provided to both campaigns and will serve as a starting point for our conversation. Then Laurel Washington uh, uh, of the Chicago Sun-Times, a fellow at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, and our panelists will facilitate a discussion with each candidate, incorporating questions that Chicagoans have submitted online. Uh, and a, a special thank you to Laura for her service, both as a fellow and uh, as a moderator today. We'll hear first from Lori Lightfoot, followed by Tony Preckwinkle, and each candidate will be allowed five minutes uh, for closing remarks. Uh, before we begin, uh, a few notes of housekeeping. Make sure your phones are on silent. No signs or banners are permitted in the audience, and we ask that you hold your applause until the very end of each candidate's time so we can have uh, a, a full, uh, undisrupted uh, discussion. So now, uh, please join me in welcoming Jens Ludwig, the director of the Crime Lab. Thanks very much to the IOP for organizing this, for the candidates for coming, for all of you for coming. Thinking about public safety in Chicago, I think has the, has the potential to make us feel numb. The number of stories, the numbers that we see day after day after day. I think it's critically important for us to keep in mind that behind every one of these numbers that we see is a human life, that every one of these lives matters, and that every one of these lives is connected to a family and a community that's now completely devastated. The problem that we see in Chicago is something that literally every city across the United States is struggling with. So if you look across different cities, cities are so different in size, looking at the total number of homicides in a city is not very useful. It's much more useful to look at the number of murders per capita or murders per 100,000 people living in a city. You can see that Chicago has a murder rate that's substantially higher than many cities in America, but there are also many cities that have substantially higher murder rates than what we have here in Chicago. So while Chicago is not unique in struggling with the problem of gun violence, we are in a very unique point in time right now here in the city of Chicago. Um, you can see that in this graph. This shows you murder rates per capita in Chicago going back to the late 1800s. That's the red line in this graph. Um, we're also showing the murder rates for New York City, which is the green line, and Los Angeles, which is the blue line. So I think there are two things that are really striking about this figure. One is the incredible consistency over most of the last century in the rate of murders per capita in these three cities with just two key exceptions. One is the 1920s in the Prohibition era, and the other is right now. So as we are entering into the mayoral election, I think it's, it's important to keep in mind this is a very, very unusual historical moment that we have for our city. This problem of gun violence in the city of Chicago is very, very closely related 
to inequality and in most other social problems across the neighborhoods in the city. You can see that in this map. Gun violence is very disproportionately concentrated on the south side and particularly the west side of the city. These are the same neighborhoods where, where poverty and related social problems are very concentrated. Now, given the amount, given this neighborhood patterning of gun violence in the city of Chicago and the enormous amounts of racial and economic segregation we have in the city, the result of this is massive disparities in mortality rates from homicide across race and ethnic groups in Chicago particularly for men. This leads gun violence to be a first order major public health crisis in the city. If you look at the United States as a whole, homicide is one of the uh, large contributing factors to overall disparities in life expectancy between blacks and whites in the United States. And the, the challenge for gun violence extends far beyond just the families that are victimized and the communities directly that are victimized. In many ways, the problem of gun violence may be a, a very threat to the future of the city itself. So some of my colleagues at the University of Chicago have done research showing that every homicide that happens in a city reduces the city's population by 70 people, by increasing the rate at which people move out and reducing the rate at which people are willing to move in. Here's what that means in practice for our city. So this is a graph that shows you Population levels for several different cities in the United States, where the population in each year is expressed as a share of that city's 1950 population, okay? And so the top line here is New York City, and what you can see is that New York City was experiencing population loss through the 1980s, and then rebounded and is now, if anything, a little bit larger now than it was in 1950. The bottom line here shows you what happened to Detroit. You can see that since 1950, Detroit lost fully 60% of its population. And almost exactly in the middle of New York City and Detroit is Chicago. I think in many ways, this is one of the key big picture questions for the city as a whole is which direction are we going to go next? Are we going to go the direction of a thriving city like New York or a dying city like Detroit? Now, the good news the good news is that this is, not, this is not an inevitable feature of modern urban life. Right? We can see that Los Angeles and New York have figured out ways to make great progress on this problem. We can also see from the research literature that there are a variety of solutions that seem to be effective. We're developing a good body of evidence on different things that we can do. Here's what I think the challenge will be for the next mayor. Whatever combination of strategies the next mayor puts in place, the one thing that we can be very sure of is any serious solution to this problem is going to be enormously expensive. And I think much more expensive than almost anybody is currently talking about in the city. You should be thinking well into the nine figures. We're also going to need resources to implement the other part of the crime and criminal justice, the related crime and criminal justice challenge in the city, which is implementing the consent decree for the Chicago Police Department. Um, that the, police, the consent decree for the police department imposes a lot of new requirements and uh, compliance rules for the department. But the other thing that it does is it invests, looks to make a, a number of additional investments in the police department as well. And you can see why that is from reading the DOJ report, the Department of Justice report about the police department. There is something going on with the Chicago Police Department right now. Um, you can see that the, the rate of suicides among police officers here in Chicago is fully 60% higher than what you see in the national average. Um, so the new mayor is gonna come in. They're facing a big public safety problem that's most likely gonna take an enormous amount of resources in a city that has a budget situation that's not great. Um, let me close by considering the question of where the resources might come from. And so let me leave you with one striking feature of the state and local tax system that we have here in Chicago. So imagine that you're a household towards the bottom of the income distribution. Your annual income is $25,000. That's about the poverty rate that we have. Uh, that's about the poverty rate for a family of four. That household living in Chicago pays something around 15% more state and local taxes living in Chicago than they would if they lived in New York instead. Now imagine instead that you're an affluent family in Chicago with an annual income of about $150,000.
If you're living in Chicago rather than New York, you're paying something like 15% lower state and local taxes living in Chicago compared to living in New York. Or put differently, we have a city right now that effectively gives tax breaks to rich people while poor people are going through a public health crisis. This is a set of very, very serious challenges that whoever takes over the fifth floor of City Hall is gonna face. I'm very grateful to the candidates and for all of you for being here to discuss these issues today. Thank you very much. Washington and I'm going to be facilitating this very crucial time of conversation today. You're in for a, a very different kind of conversation than you may have heard before on this campaign trail or any other campaign trail. We have with us today three renowned experts in the areas of crime, policing, and community engagement who are going to lead us to a conversation with our candidate, Lori Lightfoot. I'd like to first introduce them and then we'll get right into the conversation. To my immediate right is, uh, next to the candidate is Liz Dozier, who is a former principal of Fenger High School on Chicago's far south side. She's currently founder and CEO of Chicago Beyond, a social impact investor that backs the fight for youth equity and justice. Alex Kotlowitz is an award-winning journalist, author, and documentarian. His new book, An American Summer, Love and Death in Chicago, chronicles the city's violence through a series of intimate stories in some of Chicago's most turbulent neighborhoods. And Charles Ramsey has served as police commissioner in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., and he is the former deputy superintendent and a 30-year veteran of the Chicago Police Department. In 2014, he served as co-chair of President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. Give them all a round of applause. And of course, you all know Lori Lightfoot, mayoral candidate, former president of the Chicago Police Board, and chair of the Police Accountability Task Force. We want this to be a conversation, but we've got a lot to get to. We've got 40 minutes, so we want to be pithy and smart and wise. And we've got the best people in the room to do that, starting with Liz Dozier. Can you kick it off for us, Liz? Sure. Uh, so I guess just to ground us on uh, a few things. So I, just a uh, quick story. Um, I was on 47th Street, actually 47th and Cottage uh, yesterday. I was actually getting my hair done. And uh, I was on the phone outside the beauty shop. And uh, I heard this sound kind of in the background. There's, if you know that area, there's McDonald's like right across the street. Um, and all these people started rushing out of the McDonald's. And people had uh, looks of terror and confusion and crying uh, on their faces. Um, and someone was shooting inside the McDonald's. And I saw it, and I saw everyone come out, um, and someone died. And some of you may have read about it in the news, or you may have not. Um, but for a lot of people, me included, that wasn't the first time that we bared witness to an event like this, um, an extreme act of violence here in our city. And I say all this to really push on, like, what is the long-term strategy around uh, violence here in our city? How is, what is gonna be different for that 15-year-old boy that I saw run out of the McDonald's with a complete look of confusion and trauma, honestly, on his face? How is his Chicago gonna look and feel different in two years, in four years? And just talk to me about the strategies and levers that are in your control as the uh, mayor, like what you can pull. Well, I think we have to have immediate impact now. Um, the election's on April 2nd. The new mayor will be sworn in um, on May 20th, which is well into uh, the summer violence season. So if I'm fortunate enough to become the next mayor, that night I'm calling Eddie Johnson to schedule a meeting with his executive team for the next morning to understand where they are in their planning. You know, one of the questions and narratives that's been part of this campaign is, well, what about Eddie Johnson? What are you gonna do? And I've resisted, frankly, pandering to the crowd because the police department obviously needs to stay on its mission of serving and protecting us. 
it needs to start the implementation of the consent decree, and long before the new mayor is sworn in, it has to have a dynamic and robust plan for the summer violence season. So I do not believe that it's appropriate to be talking about Eddie Johnson's fate when all of those things lay before us, and they have to stay focused on their mission in making him and his executive team lame ducks before the summer in particular makes no sense to me. But we have to have immediate impact now. We cannot continue to have so many young people growing up with fear as their constant companion. We can't have neighborhoods where, as I've heard from people all over the city, they feel like there's a narrow window of time during the daylight hours where they can actually go outside because they feel like they're on lockdown every other uh, moment of the day. Well, Charles, is one Just follow a follow-up if, if I can. Just a follow-up if I can. Uh, gun violence is what we're talking about here. So uh, talk a little bit about those people that uh, engage in, in violent acts with a firearm, the individual, whoever that was that was shooting in the McDonald's for an example. What are your thoughts about uh, repeat offenders in particular who are using guns to commit crime, armed robbery or whatever it may be, uh, or just shooting? Should they be held in jail pending their, uh, their trial? Or well, should they be released? Look, every circumstance is different, but somebody who decides to again pick up a firearm and cause harm is a, is a danger to the community, pure and simple. The calculus is, are you a flight risk or are you a danger to the community? I think they demonstrate through the allegations. And again, I'm mindful of the presumption of innocence, but when you've got that kind of history, particularly if you're a felon in possession, if you're somebody who um, has a record of gun trafficking or other acts of violence, you should not be back out on the street. Now that means we ought to do a heck of a lot better job than we're seeing at Cook County in particular of, of moving these cases expeditiously through the system so people aren't languishing for years before they have their day in court. And, and we know the tragedy that people of all, si of all stripes who are accused of crime sit in Cook County for two and three years and end up pleading guilty to something that they may or may not have committed. But people who have a demonstrated violent background, we have to focus on those people. What we're seeing in this epidemic of violence, from my perspective, is really a public health crisis. We have to look at, and frame it that way, to look at the root causes of the violence. And a lot of this is crimes of poverty, crimes of desperation. But we can't have tolerance for gun violence. We also need to make sure that our federal partners are stepping up and doing their work. I've been very critical of the U.S. Attorney's Office here, my former office, which I loved, but because they haven't stepped up, I think, and really carried the weight, their weight in prosecuting gun crimes. For the last year in which we have statistics, that's FY16, which is October of 15 to uh, October of 16, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Chicago prosecuted a mere 69 gun cases. And you compare that same time period to Detroit or Baltimore or St. Louis, smaller offices with less resources, those officers were producing 200 and 300 gun violence cases. We, the federal partners have to step up. And I think anybody in CPD who's worrying about these, these cases, and the superintendent included, would tell you that the most violent offenders that are out there on the street, they don't fear state prosecution. They fear federal prosecution. But it's got to be a proactive plan to deal with gun violence, not just here in Chicago, but in Gary, in Hammond, in Indianapolis, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All of the states that are the sources of the guns have to be coordinated with the local police departments to stop the traffickers, the felons in position, possession, and the straw purchasers. Alex? Yeah, so I was going to ask you to maybe back up a little bit because you know, for me, the, what's been most unsettling and disturbing is the stubborn persistence of the violence over the past 30 years. And I guess, uh, and I'm sure that as you travel outside the city, people, it's one of the first questions people have for you. And, I, and I, I, I guess my question to you is, how do you explain the violence to others? What do you see as, and you talk about the root causes, because it's more than just obviously just a, a problem of policing. And so how do you think about the reasons behind what we've experienced. In Listen, it's really hard to explain it. I mean, I grew up in a very small town, and I'm fortunate to have my mother, who's 90 years old, um, still living. When I talk to her on the phone daily, as I do, or when I'm there with her, it is a constant stream of conversation. And, and also, as I've been running for mayor and traveling all over the city, trying to explain to my now 11-year-old daughter 
that she doesn't have to fear for me when I've traveled to areas of the city that have been plagued by gun violence is a really hard conversation to have. So I think about it what, in the way that I've said, which is there are areas of our city that are not only different, that's not, it's not just a tale of two cities, that's way too simplistic, and you know this. It's, it's like we live in a different country. We live in, people are living in just shamefully unacceptable conditions where frankly the illegal drug trade is the largest employer in way too many neighborhoods. And when that happens, violence is going to follow. Now that's not something easily explained to an 11 year old, but I know that to be true as part of the problem. We have to give people an opportunity to hope that they can dream beyond their current circumstances, and more specifically, to connect up with the legitimate economy because it actually exists in their neighborhood. We cannot continue on a law enforcement first and only strategy. It's not working, that's very clear, and it's never gonna get at the real root causes of that are, are permeating in these neighborhoods and seeing that manifest itself in these explosions of violence. Now, Liz, I know that you have, that's a particular issue of yours, of the, the role of the community in all this. Yes, yeah, so I just was curious, so what does that actually look like in very practical terms? I, I do agree with you in terms of the root causes and really getting to the base of that is, is what will, will, where we'll be able to see that long-term systemic change in our city. Um, and we have oftentimes play whack-a-mole in, in a lot of ways. And so what does that look like in very practical terms, you know, in terms of whatever it is, programs or kind of your strategy, and then what does it look, how do you actually pay for it? So as a principal, like here's a bottom line budget that you have and you've got to, that's it. That's what you've got to work with. And so what does that look like? Where does money come from to do what you're proposing? Well, a lot of what I'm proposing is a, is a shift in focus and priorities. But let's be clear, we're paying for it now. The, the lack of investment, um, the, the poverty that we're seeing has real tangible costs. We're paying for it by the excessive amount of law enforcement that we need in the city. We're paying for it by the number of people that are cycling through the criminal justice system and something that's supposed to be due process and, and justice but looks nothing like it if you've gone to any of the criminal courthouses. We're paying through, uh, for it by the lack of access to good quality medical care with people showing up in the emergency room and using that as their primary care doctor. So there are real tangible costs that are existing right now today. What I think we have to do is a number of things, and, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible, which is different, difficult when I'm summarizing an 18-page single-space public safety pro, uh, program, but I'll do my best. Two large pillars. One is treating it as a public safety, um, a public health crisis. That means investment, investment, investment. Investment in jobs, investment in um, small businesses, investment in stitching back together the social safety net, and particularly around uh, mental health and trauma services. You know, we have kids here that are uh, experiencing a level of trauma that's akin to veterans that have done multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. That has to fundamentally change. So that's part of it. And I also say from a, from a mayor's perspective, let me make sure that you're clear about this. Right now in the city of Chicago, we have two people who are full-time focused on the full array of public safety responsibilities for this entire city. Not just policing, but everything. If you compare that to New York, that has about 50 people in its Mayor's Office of Public Safety, or 30 in LA, it's hard to say that we are really serious about public safety in this city. And I don't mean to be flip or trivialize it, but we gotta put our money where our mouth is. That's why I propose standing up a robust Mayor's Office for Public Safety, which will be the first of its kind, and making sure that we're not only attending to the violence, but dealing with this growing community of victims that we have all over the city. Making sure that we have a real thoughtful policy and practices for the returning citizens that are coming back into communities, particularly on the west side, by the thousands every month into circumstances that were every bit as bad, if not worse, than what they had before. So that's some of it, and making sure that the pillars and the levers of city government are being effectively utilized to combat this challenge of our time. We have to have that kind of focus. On the other part of it, um, sorry, Laura, I'll be quick, um, is, the, is, is the gun violence. And I, I explained part of it, which is making sure that our federal partners stand up, but we also have to do something about the terrible, awful statistics of a homicide clearance rate that's 17%, and if you have the audacity to live after you're shot, it's in the single digits. 
And I've got very specific ideas about how we can address that issue as well. And what are those ideas? Can I? Can I? Okay. Because I know you talked earlier about this notion of justice, and that's where that I think that trust in the police completely yeah. erodes. Well, we had we had a particularly violent uh, weekend last summer. I think it was in July, where 70 people were shot, um, 12 killed, and almost every single one of them was outdoors. What I understand is that these were uh, some of the violence was around these big, huge outdoor parties that were trending on Facebook. And the intelligence side of the police department understood that, passed it over to the patrol division, but we didn't act. The, we didn't send extra patrols out. We didn't make sure that the uh, people that were sponsoring those parties were doing what they needed to do. And as a result, we had 12 people shot. And by my understanding, still, these many months later, there's only been a single person that has been arrested and is facing um, the criminal justice system as a result of um, those shootings. Uh, over that weekend. Well, that, that's obviously unacceptable. So the first question is, what happened in the breakdown between the intelligence side and the patrol division? We gotta fix that. We also need to make sure that our detective division gets out from behind their desk in the areas and is embedded in the neighborhoods, just like the patrol division is, so that they start to build relationships with the community way before the shootings happen. No one is going to trust in this very dangerous environment some white guy, which is mostly what they are, showing up in a white shirt and a, and a tie, knocking on their door, fronting them, frankly, in front of everybody in the neighborhood, and saying, hey, by the way, did you see something? Will you tell me about it? People are afraid to put themselves at risk in that kind of environment. We also need to make sure that our detective division is trained in all of the latest technology, from the cameras that we have all over the city, Shot Spotter, which is an incredibly important technology that we had, I think, probably around the time that, that Chuck was last here, um, but we've now reinvested in that for, uh, as a result of philanthropic dollars that have come into the city, that they are actually also working in the st uh, strategic decision centers that have been stood up with the assistance of the, the crime lab that they know about the Niven technology that was formed by the ATF so that they can understand how powerful that is in tracking shell, shell casings and understanding how guns travel. So there's a lot of training that has to be done that frankly our detective division doesn't have right now. But the biggest thing is making sure they're closer to the streets, that they are forming good relationships with the patrol officers who know those streets as well as anybody else, and that they are understanding that doing a canvas after a shooting isn't community relations. Chuck, I'd love to get your reaction to, 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 to the strategy she's laying out in particular. I know that you're very concerned about training and she brought up training. You want to well, I am very concerned about training uh, and that was only reinforced yesterday. I was in uh, New York at NYPD. They asked me to speak at their executive leadership uh, conference that they have periodically. They just spent $750 million for a brand new state of the art police academy. And what I liked about it and was the fact that it was, it was 21st century in, 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 in the sense that there was a lot of space devoted to role play. So they can begin to put officers in scenarios and they actually test them on their judgment and things of that nature. They, you know, whether it's dealing with someone on a subway car or maybe it's in a bar, uh, whatever it might be, they actually have space set aside where they recreated that. And I, and I, and I think that in fact, I know here in Chicago, our, the police academy here is at least about 45 years old. Uh, and it was never in the greatest of shape to begin with. Um, they need a new facility here. Uh, what are your plans around the training for police officers? Because I think that with this consent decree, and I'm on the, I'm on the monitoring team in both Baltimore and Cleveland, training is essential. Without training and education, it's simply not going to go very far. You have to invest and spend time retraining officers. You just mentioned it with uh, 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 detectives and how they canvass and how they make death notifications, all those kinds of things. So what are your plans around improving training for officers? And I just, I just want to add to that, as I understand, you're not necessarily in favor of the police and fire training academy as it's, as, as it's being proposed now. And which is, uh, sounds like it's along the lines of what you saw in New York, Chuck. Well, I, I was struck by one of the comments that, that Chuck just made, which is $750 million in a state-of-the-art training facility in New York. What we are talking about here is $98 million, well, look, which, is, which, is, which is, 
Well, but it's not going to be 98 million. If you're really going to do it right, it's going to be far more than that. The challenges that I have with the current plan, Chuck is 100% correct, and let me give you a, a reason why we absolutely need a new tra training facility. When we were doing our work on the Police Accountability Task Force, I remember sitting in the conference room with the then executive team at the academy, and we had spent many, many hours with them. And I asked the question, so is there any annual mandatory training that is required by veteran officers other than firearms qualifications? And the team kind of looked at each other, looked at each other again, and shook their head no. So imagine this. The police department's most important asset is its people. And yet, for years, we have done virtually nothing to provide them with the kind of support and leadership training and, and, and all kinds of real world trainings that translate to their ability to effectively um, do their job on the street. And that, that, that absence of training continues to manifest itself um, every single day in their relationships with people on the street. The fact that we don't have uh, opportunities for them to engage in simulated um, training that, that mimics what they're going to see and hear and feel on the street is a real problem. So my issue isn't that we need more training, we desperately need it. And the roadmap for that was laid out in the Police Accountability Task Force that was picked up by the Obama DOJ report. Some of that is now uh, memorialized in the consent decree. But beyond that, we have to be thinking smart about the way that we make these big investments in a community that is so resource starved. So it's not just the police academy, it's about we're gonna make up an investment in this really, really poor west side neighborhood where tensions between the community and the police are fraught. There hasn't been a plan to think about how that investment could actually spur other economic um, development in that area that desperately needs it. So what would you do differently? Would you put, put it in a different neighborhood? Would you spread out the facilities? No, what I, would be the substantive difference I, I, I between what you would do? I wouldn't necessarily put it in a different neighborhood, but I think that there has to be, in every investment that we make, a process that starts with respectful engagement of the people in the community whose lives are gonna be most affected. Whether it's this or whether it's other in, on other policy implications, that wasn't done here, and that's why I've had a problem with it. The other thing I would say is, in talking to um, some of the potential bidders, and this was when I was at my law firm, they looked at the plan and said, this doesn't seem like it was drafted by people who actually know what a real training facility ought to look like. We ought to be putting together a state-of-the-art training facility ourselves. It ought to be something, frankly, that we can monetize and bring other local law enforcement at every level, uh, local, state, and federal, into that training facility and have it pay for itself and, frankly, help us um, address some of the needs in the police department through that revenue stream. But there doesn't feel like that kind of thoughtfulness and planning as going into the so-called COP Academy. Well, the, <clears throat> the city council is, is set to approve this facility and it's very likely it will be passed and approved before you take office. So what are you gonna do about that? How are you gonna well, do There's that? a lot of things that are, are attempted to be done between now and the swearing out of the next mayor. I'm gonna do whatever I can to right any wrongs if I'm fortunate enough to become the next mayor. We do need a new academy. I also frankly think from what I've talked to line police officers, people in the exempt ranks, we also have to have the flexibility to bring people to other parts of the city and not just have one centralized location. And from a logistical standpoint, when we need to do mass training, it's really difficult to do that when you have only one location. It's much easier to be able to do it when we have multiple locations. And, and let us not forget, we've got 38 schools that are vacant from the school closing, some of which could be repurposed to help us with our training needs in the police department. Sure, um, it's a little switch of uh, pivot point here, but I'm just curious, that one of the things that uh, I've seen, I think a lot of folks have seen, is you've been like all over the city, you've been listening and talking to people, um, and people have appreciated that. And I'm curious is if you think about you, know, you uh, assuming this role as mayor, like how do, you, how do you keep your ears to the ground? There's oftentimes this notion uh, that, and it's, it's, you know, 
existed for ages of like you know researchers and funders and people with particular degrees and certain institutions those are the brains and the community is the brawn so the brains are at the table oftentimes in whether it's you know city government or state or federal that's and and we oftentimes kind of shut the voice of people out and so i'm curious aside from caps meetings and those i mean how, how does how does the community play a real role in helping you think about violence and the interruption of it in, in your potential administration well, I, I'm a member of the community. I live in a neighborhood, um, and, frank, and frankly, a lot of people are, are in my ear about a range of different things. And you said the brains are at the table. The brains are in the community. Mm -hmm. The brains are at every level of the city who are engaged in a daily struggle and experience with violence. And it would be foolish to be in such a bubble as a mayor, as a policymaker, not to be out in communities talking to folks. I'm mindful that some of my former colleagues on the police board are here today, which I appreciate. We have to make sure that we are reflecting the lived experience of people in the city. You're gonna hear me say that over and over again. We can't have policies that are created on the fifth floor of City Hall and then trot it out to the neighborhood to sold to people as what's best for them. And how do you do that? Mm -hmm. you, you do that by having open and honest dialogue with folks. If you're thinking about taking on a challenge, You've got to know who the relevant stakeholders are. You invite everyday folks into that discussion. And then you start a process by which you engage and look at the nuances for policy. I know from my own experience in public life that if people feel like they are heard, that they have a seat at the table, even if they don't agree at the end of the day as to what the policy prescription is, it's going to have far more legitimacy because the process has been one that's engaged people all over who are um, strong, have strong opinions, expertise, and who are affected by whatever that policy is. So that is the way that I will govern, because for me, that's the only way that you can get to the best results. Lori, well, can I ask in that regard, I mean, you've had a really varied career in the U.S. Attorney's Office as a private attorney, as a, a part of the police board. And I guess one of the questions I have is, has there ever been a moment or moments where that have, in your interaction with the community, has upended your thinking about the violence? That's what I'm saying. Uh, upended your thinking about the violence. Has changed the way you view the world? Because it's one of the things about, I think we hear about politicians often is that they have such great certitude. And so I think Liz's question is really, not only will you interact with the community, but will you hear them and have them challenge your own assumptions? And, well, there, there are two experiences that kind of stick out in my mind, particularly over this last year, that have really made me um, think longer and harder about what the solution should be. And let me give you two examples. I have spent a lot of time over the arc of this campaign with people who are victims of violence, people who have lost their children. And there's a huge community of victims that are out there every single day. And I met many of them very early on. They've been with me along this journey. So I'm much more I think, thoughtful and empathetic to what they're experiencing. And I hope you see that, not only in the way that I talk about things, but in the written policies that I have developed because of my experience with them. I've also been really deeply affected by seeing poverty in the city. Diane Latiker, who some of you know, who has a program called Kids Off the Block, we were down with her right before the Christmas holiday, and she got a lot of food, donated, and was feeding literally her neighbors, people in her community. This was a really bitterly cold day. There was a tent, but most of it was outside, and the tent where the food was being served wasn't, wasn't large enough for anybody to sit down and eat comfortably, and yet the line of people was around the block. And when I looked at those people, those young mothers and kids and young men, you could see the face of poverty. And knowing that, that meal that they were gonna get, which was modest, was probably gonna be the thing that fed them, not just for that day, but maybe multiple days. We have to really understand the lack of, of resources and deprivation that are pervasive in so many neighbors. That's in Roseland, 
but the same thing exists in Austin and Inglewood. And you look at the areas in our city that are most economically distressed, it is a one-to-one -one match for those areas that are most crime plagued. That's why I know that we have to get at the root causes of the violence by investing in people and neighborhoods and families because we will never get ahead of the curve if we don't do that. I'd like to pause here and uh, say that we did solicit questions from you, folks in the audience and the community, and I have one here I'd like to share now. It's from Mary Long, who lives in Grand Crossing. What steps will you take to expand and or coordinate mental health services to address the root causes of crime? We've had a shredding of our mental health resources, not just by the closure of the clinics, but of course that accelerated that problem. The truth is those clinics weren't doing and reaching the number of people that they need to reach. So it's a flashpoint in conversation, and absolutely we need to rebuild that, that social safety net. But I know from my experience in dealing with a lot of mental health professionals in the city that we have to have a strategy that also incorporates what I'll call the private sector, that is the community-based um, clinics and hospitals that really are, I think, more adept at reaching a range of people who are suffering from trauma and mental health illnesses than what we were able to do with our meager resources that we are, we've devoted to the clinics, even at full operation. Our, it just largely, um, our public health department has to be significantly expanded. If we had a major health epidemic in the city, I worry whether or not we'd be able to meet that challenge. Most of the funding for our public health department is based upon grants, which is an uncertain and steady form of resources. We have to devote far more corporate dollars to our public health um, system generally, but particularly when it comes to areas of mental health and trauma. And as you know, the mayor cut the mental health, health clinics, and as you say, that was a flashpoint. Where would the, would the revenues come from to build up this much larger system? Well, I think, once again, it's got to be a question of priorities, which we have to make it. But the other thing that's happened in the wake of those closures is a number of communities have put referendums on the ballot to have a, I think the funding is from a property tax, a slight increase, to fund community-based mental health services. So that's actually happening now in communities um, all over uh, the city, particularly in the north side and a few places on the west side where those mental health clinics were closed. But unlike like a lot of issues, the city has to step up on these. This is a crisis. It has real economic and other consequences for, the, for us as a community. So we need to find the resources. Grant funding, don't get me wrong, for the philanthropic uh, community, we love you, um, keep it coming. But the city itself has to step up and put real money behind um, that most urgent um, public health system. Mental health is something I'm, I'm very uh, much uh, concerned about uh, when it comes to violence and the aftermath of violence. Um, my question, let me start just kind of giving you an example. Um, when I was commissioner in Philadelphia and also in Washington, um, I'd go to homicide scenes. And in the summertime, you've got the tape and you got all that, you know, and you, you do crime lab and the detectives are doing what they do. Um, but when you look across the street or down the street, you see children out. You see adults that are out. When the scene is, is finished, the processing, you know, you take the tape down and, and so forth, but people still live there and they still have the memories of, of what took place. I, start, I started making the officers take all the tape down, not just break it and leave it hanging and get the fire department to hose down the sidewalk. Then I thought about, you know, well, what about those children? What school do they go to? How do I reach out to that school uh, to, you know, uh, let teachers know if you start to see, you know, a change in behavior, maybe this is the reason why. It was impossible to do. Between getting information from the public school system, some of these kids go to charter schools. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. There's no more neighborhood schools like it used to be years ago. So how do you really, because to me, intervention is key before they start to exhibit some behaviors. That's part one. I mean, how do you coordinate? I agree it's a public health issue, but how do you get all the right people at the, play, at, at the table and then be able to take action when something like that happens? The other part of that, unfortunately, here in Chicago, there have been seven officers commit suicide in the last six months. 
Um, all of it may not have been due to stress on the job, but officers are exposed to trauma on a regular, ongoing basis. And we talk about soldiers coming back after a tour of duty in Iraq or Afghanistan after a year, two years, or whatever. Some people spend 25, 30 years exposed to violence, and yet there's very little that's done about the mental health in terms of officer wellness. So how would you address that issue uh, as well? Well, I'm happy to say that as part of the consent decree, there's going to be a renewed focus on officer wellness. This is something that we recommended now almost three years ago as part of the Police Accountability Task Force work. It wasn't taken up. The fact that we have roughly a 12,000 member, uh, sworn members in the police department, and we only have three uh, EAP counselors, is shameful. There are plenty of examples across the country, and in my research, San Diego actually comes to mind, where they've got a very robust officer wellness program that isn't just populated by social, social workers and, and clinical psychologists, but uh, although I think that's important. They also have um, got people who are on the job, who are quote unquote the real police, who are providing peer-to-peer -peer assistance and help, particularly when it comes to officer-involved shootings, which as you all know, is one of the most traumatic experiences that an officer will have over the arc of a career. Most people go through their entire career and they never fire their firearm in the line of duty. For officers who do, and having been out on probably 80 plus shooting scenes in my career, it's a very traumatizing experience. We have to do better. We have to do much, much better. It doesn't have to wait until the new mayor is set up. It doesn't have to wait on the consent decree mandating that this happen. Go back to what I said before. The most important asset that the police department has is its people. We would never have another organization structured like that where the assets are the people, where we invest so little in not only their professional development, but their health and well-being. We have to change that around dramatically. Now that's not popular in a lot of circles, but if we don't do that, it is gonna have real consequences in how these folks perform in discharging their duties every single day on the street. It endures to the benefit of the community that we have a good, well-trained, and healthy police department. So that's gotta be a critical priority. Um, and I've now already forgotten your first part, yeah, which well, is about coordinating city resources. Yeah. Yeah, Look, quickly, because it, 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 Yeah, it's not, it's not easy, it's not gonna be, but that's precisely why I think empowering a mayor's office for public safety to be able to respond to those challenges, because well, you're right, it's not just CPS, it's all the charters, it's the Catholic schools as well. It's not just uh, making sure that the fire department houses down the street. It's being there and available in those communities to provide them with support that they're absolutely going to need. There's a number of um, private groups that do that, but coordinating all those efforts has to have somebody in the mayor's office who focuses like these issues on a laser beam and has all the various stakeholders um, you know, on speed dial so that when something happens, there's a protocol that clicks into place so that we're better supporting those communities. And that gets back to your public safety uh, office idea that, that those, those are the folks that would be on the front lines on that. Absolutely. Okay, we only got about uh, th three minutes left. Uh, Alex or? Sure, I, mean, I want to go back to something that Liz alluded to earlier, which is the need for finding ways to strengthen community. And one of the things that for me has been clear spending time in places like Englewood or Lawndale or Austin is that these are communities that are still reeling from the 2008 housing crisis. And, you know, the Woodstock Institute has in, you know, uh, found that, you know, in some of these communities, one out of every six homes are abandoned. And, of course, when you have communities that begin to fray like that, they become terrain that's ripe for the violence. And so, specifically, what do we do about all these vacant properties that are so eroding the sense of community in these neighborhoods? Well, first of all, we, we have to, I think, be more creative about thinking about ways, not only that we turn those properties into valuable real estate for people in the community, whether by building you know, maybe $100,000 homes. I think there's a lot of developers in the city that have a great interest and doing something like that, providing real affordable home op options, making sure that we're providing resources to existing homeowners that are living in homes that they can't afford to keep, um, keep and maintain. Those are things that I think the city has to play a role in, in partnership with philanthropy and private, the private sector. <clears throat> I think we also have to make sure <clears throat> that those communities get the same kind of city resources that communities on the north side do. When you travel, for example, on the west side, not only are those neighborhoods have vacant lots and dilapidated housing, we're tolerating a level of violence and community 
I don't even know what the word is, but I think about the fact that I, I was actually on the West Side on Sunday, and I was talking to uh, a group of folks, and there's a strip mall over there that business is going on, but when you pull into the parking lot, you got some guys yelling, blow, blow, and selling dope out in the open. That has an effect on people in that community. I frankly called the superintendent and said, we gotta do something about this, this is nuts. We have to appreciate that people in economically distressed neighbors have a right to live in safety and peace. And quality of life matters just as much to them as it does to us. And it's not right for us to essentially deprive them of city resources like garbage collection, like public safety, like good quality schools, and all the other things that we take for granted as being essential and necessary to having good, stable communities. So that is why I've talked about really needing a Marshall Plan for those neighborhoods where we can come in and, and add jet fuel to the, the, the things that are already happening. Every single one of those communities has good people in it. There are things that are happening on the ground that are positive, but we need to scale them up. We need to break down the silos, and the city has to lead in that effort. We are uh, down to the wire, and uh, we would like to allow you to have closing remarks. But as you think about anything else you want to sh share with us, think about what you've heard today from this very illustrious panel, and what you've learned from them, and how that to tell us about how that might impact your decision making and policy making going forward. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here with people who have devoted their lives and careers. Uh, not only to public safety, but to social justice and equity and inclusion. And I'm very mindful of that and I'm grateful for the conversation. But my, my thoughts and, and um, ideas about how we can make our community safe are also informed by the people out there who are living in really difficult circumstances every single day. We have an obligation to speak to their needs. We have an obligation to not let them feel like nobody hears them or sees them and that they are on their own in dealing with incredibly difficult circumstances. Let me also say this. In the last seven years, we've had over 23,000 people shot in the city. That is an unacceptable number. And it's not just the statistics that are chilling, which is frankly larger than the, the small town that I grew up in. Every single one of those shots is lives on either side of the gun that have been shattered that families who are going to be, ever be living with the trauma of that moment and the moments like that, we have an obligation as a city to do far better. And if I'm fortunate enough to become mayor, there will be no greater priority for me than to bring peace and safety to our neighborhoods. Peace and safety cannot be a commodity that is only available to the wealthy. We, ha we can do better than that in a city, and I know how to lead us in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Lori Lightfoot. Thank you for our time. So we're going to take a brief pause. Thank you, Lori, for being with us. I know you've got another uh, 12 or so hours ahead of you of campaigning. Yeah, yeah, thanks, so, <laughs> thanks for sharing some time with us. And good luck. Okay. Don't forget to vote on April 2nd. <laughs> Just a couple minutes and we'll be starting with uh, Tony Perequico.
Tony just gave a, a plug to, uh, to Alex for his fresh air appearance for his book. If you haven't, if you haven't heard that in interview, you want to hear it. Thank you, Madam President, for being with us today. Of course. This is um, a 40 minute, 45 minute conversation, and so we have a lot of topics to get to. And as you know, we have a very illustrious panel of experts. So we're hoping for a different kind of a conversation than maybe you had on the campaign trail where we really get more deeply into the issues and come up with some, as much as possible some specific solutions and ideas to take us forward on, on the issue of public safety. So we're going to start with Liz. Great. So welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, just want to ground us like in the, in the strategy around violence and so just a little context. I was on 47th Street yesterday right across the street uh, when that shooting happened inside the McDonald's. And I saw all these people running out, I mean, grandmothers, children, teenagers uh, coming out, and someone passed away uh, inside that McDonald's yesterday. And that wasn't my first time seeing something like that or being in, in that moment. And I don't think it was the first time for many of the people that were running out of that McDonald's. And so I really want to push on, like, what is the long-term strategy for us as a city? And how does that 15-year-old boy, one of many that I saw running out of that McDonald's, what are they going to see different in two years or in four years under your administration? What does it actually look like? How does it look different? And what's the strategy behind it? What, the levers that are under your control? I do. Good afternoon. You know, I'm a teacher by profession. And early in my teaching career, I lost a student to gun violence. She was murdered in a drive-by on her own front porch. She just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I know what a devastating effect that had on her fellow students, on me, on the faculty, on the community. There was an empty chair in my classroom for the rest of the school year. Everybody has the right to feel safe in their home and in their communities. And the real challenge is to try to have better collaboration between the police and the community. And we clearly don't have that now. Um, in many of our communities, the police are seen as an occupying force. And we have cameras and uh, shot spotters and all kinds of technology. But we still have more murders as the third largest city in the country than New York and Los Angeles combined. And while we desperately need to invest in more training, we've done a disservice to our police officers by not providing them with more professional training over time and over a long period of time. Actually, I talked to a high-ranking officer in the last month or so who uh, admitted that he had, had gotten a refresher course in, in, in use of force it was the first time that he had such a course since he was in the academy, which was decades before. We need better training for officers. We need better supervision. The model, the national model, is one sergeant for every eight officers. And in some of our police districts, it's one sergeant for every 30 officers. We also have to hold our police force more accountable. You probably know that nationally, out of every 100 murders, 62 or 63 suspects are arrested. But here in Chicago, it's less than 20%. Depending on who you talk to, it's 15, 16, 17% of the murder cases someone's actually arrested. And for the shootings, it's less than 10%. So for our most serious crimes, we're not doing a very good job of bringing the guilty to justice. And of course, that has a devastating and ripple effect in the communities. Because if you know that the person who killed your brother or your uncle or your dad or your neighbor is unlikely to be brought to justice, the temptation is to seek revenge or retaliation yourself. And of course, that just magnifies the violence. I w let me just add, you know, um, The people who do the shooting are also those who are most likely to be the victims. And this is a, this is a public health crisis. And we are particularly impacted in the county because our health and hospital system, Stroger Hospital, has a world-class trauma center. And we get a lot of the gunshot victims in our health and hospital system. 
And we've started a program called Healing Hurt People to work with the young people who have come into our, our hospital who've been shot. I think the age cohort is like 16 to 24. To help them change the arc of their lives because they need not just physical healing, um, but frankly, I guess I could only describe it as sort of addressing the spiritual challenges they face as well. Because if somebody is shot, the chances are very good that they will be in our hospital again shot in the next two or three years. And so we work with them in, in, to address both the trauma that they have experienced physically and the trauma that they feel, they've uh, experienced in a, in a social emotional sense to try to help them change the arc of their lives. And if we can get them in the program and keep them there, we have a good chance of, of preventing them from returning to our emergency room. Um, so how would that so how would that experience with the county and your and your vision, how does that translate specifically? What what are the top three public safety priorities that you would you would ex execute as mayor and what would be the specifics behind that? Well when I when I was elected alderman uh, in the nineties we invested a considerable amount of money in community policing. We don't do that anymore. And that was an opportunity for community residents to meet police officers as human beings, and police officers to meet community residents, and to share information, share concerns of you know, what was happening on the beat, what the real challenges were. Um, and I or my staff would always go to those meetings. Uh, and they were very helpful to us to learn where the problems are, and I think to community residents to know about the challenges the police face and for the police to get information from the community. And we've disinvested in that. So you would ramp that up? I would ramp that up. Okay. So that's, a, that's the first thing. I mean, we need to do all the things that the, the consent decree has required of us, of course, investing in, in training and supervision. But I, I, as I said, we've got we've to hold the police force accountable. That means more detectives. Um, but it also means that we have to change the complexion of the detective corps, um, which is overwhelmingly white and male and most of the violence that's plaguing our city is in brown and black neighborhoods. So we have to add a considerable number of detectives, and it takes a while to learn to be a good detective. Um, my understanding is that, that McCarthy decimated the detective corps, and that's one of the reasons for the challenges that we face. We don't have enough people, actually, to, to um, and the caseloads are too high for detectives to really, really have them be effective. So you would increase the detective corps by how, how much and... and, and to, to be determined, but we clearly need to continue to ramp up um, uh, the ranks of our detective corps. Um, so that's the, that would be the second thing. But, you know, the communities that, are, are, that suffer most from violence um, have multitude of challenges. The, the violence is one of the many symptoms of the challenges that they face. Um, you know, their, their school, their high levels of unemployment, they're under-resourced schools, there's low levels of education attainment, they're often food deserts, they're often places which, which don't have good access to health care. So we have, to, we have to address the, the multifaceted challenges that these communities face. You know, when, when, I, was, when I was alderman of the Fourth Ward, um, we worked hard with commanders and local police officers and community residents to address public safety challenges. And you have to do that at, at the kind of nitty-gritty, granular level to make a real impact. Um, but you also have to make, you know, sort of systemic changes in the police department. And, you know, that's, that's part of the issue. It's also, as I said, investing more in, in things like more detectives, in better training, and in community policing initiatives. Right, and I want to move to our, uh, our, the rest of our panel, but I want to follow up quickly. Investing is a key word. This, all, all of what you described is going to cost a load of money, and the city's already in deep in bad financial shape. Where will the revenues come for all these changes and the additions that you're proposing? This is just, I'm sure, just one piece of your plan. Where's the money going to come from? Well, I've been told that we need to look carefully at the police department budget and, and uh, that there might be opportunities to reallocate resources there. But you have to look at this um, on a longer time horizon. You know, we're paying, what, at least $50 million a year in police settlements. Um, for wrongful, uh, wrongful convictions, for wrongful death suits. Um, that's a tremendous burden on the taxpayers of the city of Chicago, and I think it's, what, $500 million in the last, last 10 years. And that doesn't count the, the um, sort of mega suits against us. Um, and if we invest now in better training, in better supervision, in community policing, we save money in the long run. That's why I talk about it as investments. But we don't have that money in hand now, unless you're going to no. tell us where, 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 where is it no, going to come from. I, I'm saying part of it is reallocating resources within the police department, but yes, we have to find the money because 
investing the money now saves us money in the long run and will ensure that we have a safer city for all of our residents. Do you have specific, I, I, I don't want to be a dead horse, but the, the money is important. Do you have specific sources of where you will find this funding other than, other than cuts or changes in the police department budget? No, you know, when I came into office in 2010 as president of the county, we had a $487 million gap to close. Uh, some things were apparent to me at the beginning that we needed to do. I went to every separately elected official and said, you got to cut your budget 11 percent, 15 percent. We uh, we did that. We uh, refinanced some of our debt. There were a multitude of things we did. There was no magic solution, no silver bullet. But we looked at a variety of options, and we were able to, to cut the budget. And it, it's, it's a similar situation here. You're going to have to look at all the options and make the tough decisions you need to make so that you invest the, the resources in the way that you think is appropriate. Let me just say, a budget process reflects your values. And so if you're not investing in better training for your police officers or better supervision for your police officers, that reflects your values. And we need to invest in our officers. You know, Many of our officers are, are just good and decent people who struggle every day to do a difficult job well, and we have to acknowledge that as we talk about the challenges that the police department faces. Alex. Yeah. So, Tony, I was going to ask, I mean, I, I think, I wonder sometimes whether we make the mistake of, when we talk about the violence, of, think of putting such a burden on the police because it's not simply a police problem. And I guess my question for you is for, you know, one of the things we talked to Laurie about was, you know, one of the things that clearly has, I think, really been distressing in the city is the stubborn persistence of the violence over the past three decades. And when you're asked to explain it to people not from Chicago, how do you explain it? How do you explain why the violence? Well, I think it reflects um, the profound racism and, and segregation that our city suffers from. Neither New York nor Los Angeles has the profound segregation that we have here in Chicago. And I think that's part of the reason that they have less violence. And furthermore, the poorest communities in Chicago are poorer, relatively speaking, than the poorest communities in New York and Los Angeles. In other words, the disparity between the poorest communities and the average in Chicago is much greater than in New York and Los Angeles. So our poor communities are relatively more profoundly impoverished than poor communities in New York and Los Angeles. And that's partly a result of, of the segregation. It's partly because of the profound uh, disinvestment and neglect that these communities have faced, which of course is related to the racism and the segregation. Um, and that's why when I talk about the violence, I always talk about investing in the communities. You know, what I found as we um, rebuilt North Kenwood, Oakland, Douglas, Grand Boulevard, the northern and western parts of my ward, we saw a decline in criminal activity, partly because it was more people more eyes on the street. Um, but the bad actors sort of weren't left to themselves. There were all kinds of other people in the community um, who had an interest in making sure that the streets were safe and people were comfortable in their homes. So when you, just to, to piggyback off this question, because I'm curious, so when you talk about some of the root causes, which I absolutely agree around racism and concentrated amounts of poverty and how that is different here than it is in Los Angeles and in New York. And you mentioned earlier about really getting to the, the multifaceted, challenges that undergird all of the, uh, what we're seeing here in the city. Like, so what do you do about that? Those are big, but to your point, like very long-term, very like systemic things that have been rooted in the city. Like, what do you do? Like, again, how, I would just come back to this. How, that 15-year-old was running out of the McDonald's yesterday. How's, how is it going to look different for him under your administration in like two years and four years? Yes, around racism. Yes, around concentrated poverty. But we, we're also in the now, so what, is, what looks different? Well, one of the things that we've invested in um, through the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, which is our employment training entity, is a program called Opportunity Works. And it's a program that was designed for people, young people who are at risk, some of whom were justice involved, to help them with basically internship programs um, in transportation distribution and logistics, manufacturing, careers that they could enter in at a, at a low rung on the ladder and move up, uh, oftentimes without a lot of um, formal education, uh, to give them a sense of um, work life and give them an idea of the, of the other options that are available to them in the street. Um, and that's a program that we, we've had a lot of luck with. And again, we targeted those who were at risk, those who were at risk um, identified by their school, uh, identified by their local police department, or 
um, who were already involved in the criminal justice system, justice involved youth. Uh, and we've got to invest more in programs like that uh, because there's a cohort of young people who are most likely, as I said, both to be the shooters and the victims of the shootings that we have to um, address. And that's, that's again, that's a, that's a resource and a focus issue. And, and frankly, we put our county dollars into it and I personally made calls to people who I thought might be interested in this kind of uh, program to ask them for their personal support. So we had both philanthropic and, and government resources invested in it. Chuck. You mentioned uh, training of uh, police officers a couple of times and uh, uh, both recruit training as well as in-service training, which are veteran officers that have to go through training on a regular basis or at least should go through training on a regular basis. I was in New York yesterday actually speaking at their executive leadership institute that they've just started. And uh, they have a brand new state-of-the-art police academy and what I really liked about it more than anything it, it was a 21st century design in that reality-based training was really the key uh, they had uh, the ability to create scenarios where they could actually test an officer's judgment in various situations whether it's dealing with someone in a bar whether it's going in a house whether it's you know on a, a, a subway train they actually have a subway train uh, there that they use um, the facility here in Chicago is at least 45 years old. I believe it's 75, 76 is when it was built. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, you're not in favor of a new police academy, police fire academy that was scheduled to be built over in West Garfield. Uh, if not that, then what? So talk a little bit, if you would, about one, why you're opposed to it, and two, if you're not going to go in that direction, what are you gonna do to improve the training uh, for officers in the Chicago Police Department. Uh, and let me be clear, I'm not opposed to a new training facility. I just question whether or not we need to spend $95 million on a brand new facility, whether there's an opportunity to reuse a facility elsewhere. We definitely need to invest in a facility to support our police and firefighters. And that's not the, that's not the concern. It's whether or not we need a $95, $95 million uh, new building at that location. Do you have uh, specific ideas about where, what the alternative location would be, your facility? No, but that's something I'm, I'm prepared to work on. And, and let me just say, I, I want to thank you, Chuck, for your service here in the city of Chicago and, and uh, what is it, Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. Um, you have a great reputation and we're grateful that you spent so much time here. Can I go back and just, I want to go back and piggyback off of, let's piggyback off my question, I'm going to piggyback off yours. Um, but you know, you talked about one of the things that differentiates Chicago from LA and New York is the kind of hyper segregation we have in the city. And it's actually one of the commonalities between the cities across the country that experience the kind of violence we do is this deep segregation. And it was striking to me that when, you know, we, uh, underwent the transformation plan where we tore down all the public housing high rises. There was a lot of conversation around reintegrating by income, by class, but no conversation about reintegrating around race. So as mayor, what would you do to re-engage the city in the conversation of integration, residential integration? Well, that's a tough challenge. Um, there were three CHA transformation projects in my ward. Um, one of which was one of the largest public housing developments in the city, Ida B. Wells, uh, which is now Oakwood Shores. Um, there were two smaller developments. Um, and frankly, we you're right, we focused on, entirely on income. Uh, one third public housing, one third affordable, one third market rate. Um, addressing the, the segregation in our city is a tremendous challenge. I mean, acknowledging it is one thing and talking about it in the way I just did. Um, but it's, it's very, this is a tough nut. Um, we saw as we redeveloped North Kenwood, for example, and, and Oakland, that there were white families that moved in. But frankly, it was a pretty modest number, and I had anticipated that, um, given the fact that it's 15 to 20 minutes from downtown and right near the lakefront, that we'd have a more diverse uh, cohort of people moving into the community. Um, and that didn't happen. And it's partly, you know, Chicago's long and bitter history around this issue, around the issue of segregation. So that's a good conversation to be continued. Yeah. No easy solution. I'll say. 
Liz. Yeah, on one of the, so I was a principal for about six years before doing the work that I'm doing now with Chicago Beyond. And one of the things that I was amazed by when I came into this new space, this philanthropic space, I always thought when I was sitting in Roseland on the far south side as a principal that you know, there was some like magic coordination happening as we thought about our city and we thought about violence. And what I've noticed now being in the philanthropic space is that there's a lot of philanthropic entities who are doing a lot of this coordination, uh, a lot of uh, isolated almost even from the city. And so I'm just curious, how do you think about that office of violence prevention? Like what we think about New York and LA and their, their investment of, I don't know, what is $30 million and how the multiple you know, people that exist in these offices and the coordination that happens there. Like what do you envision for Chicago, specifically on that office of violence prevention? And then if you could talk about like how it gets paid for, like what does that, where does that money come from? So New York and Los Angeles have had for more than a decade uh, offices of violence prevention or criminal justice reform or whatever, as Chicago hasn't. And actually, um, this budget cycle, so starting in January, for the first time, uh, the city has such an office. But uh, what they did was take the grants that they were um, making in other parts of the city, other, on other line items, and put them in that, in that office. Uh, so the additional spending really was only two or three hundred thousand dollars. It wasn't really, um, wasn't really at, at the magnitude that was needed. And both New York and Los Angeles for more than a decade have been putting thirty million dollars plus into these anti-violence initiatives. So when I became uh, president of the county board, uh, you know, our two principal fundamental responsibilities are public health and public safety, uh, both of which connect, of course, to the issue of violence. And I could talk a little bit about our criminal justice reform efforts, but let me just say, we, we decided uh, in, in 2013, I think, um, that we would try to do something about the pipeline of people coming into our criminal justice system. Clearly, we're running the courts and, and the jails, and we were trying to do, run the jails more efficiently and run the courts more fairly, but that we really need to do something about um, folks coming into the jail. So we started, for the first time in the county's history, to make grants to community-based organizations around violence prevention, anti-recidivism, and restorative justice. Um, starting from ground zero, we'd never done it before. And, you know, any, any time you start a new enterprise like that, there's some glitches. But over the last uh, six years or so, we've now invested $18 million in that in community-based organizations that do that good work. Um, and clearly, we need to continue to make those investments and do more. And the city has to do it as well. So do you see that, do you see that, do you see that as, a, as a model for what you would do with the Office of Violence exactly. Prevention? Exactly. The, the Office of Violence Prevention, or Criminal Justice Reform, as I would call it, you know, needs to be a place where um, the stakeholders are brought together to address the challenges. It needs to be the entity that disperses the grants, and it needs to be the policy locus. Um, and we have to invest more in, in this kind of work. And, you know, God bless the foundation and philanthropic community, because after the, the terrible spike in violence in 2016, our, um, our philanthropic organizations, the Chicago Community Trust and MacArthur Foundation in particular, uh, stepped up. And they have been investing through the Partnership for Safe and Peaceful Communities, sometimes just called the Partnership, uh, around $30 million for the last two years, 2017 and 2018, in this work. Violence prevention, anti-recidivism, restorative justice. Um, and I am grateful to them. But that's not enough. But that's not enough. So we, can't, we, can't, we, can't, we can't say that this, is, this burden should be on the, the philanthropic community. The, the public has right. to take responsibility for this. In addition, um, and we should be doing funding that same kind of work at the city at, at, the, at least the, the levels of New York and Los Angeles, given the magnitude of the, of the challenges that we face. So we're talking about, that, go, sorry, ahead. Real, this, go ahead. The scary part, I think, for, for me is that as we think about what's really happening in this city, it, it shouldn't be incumbent upon the whims of the philanthropic space, because that can change. And it can change really the fast. Flavor the, month, the flavor of the month, the flavor of the month can change, yes. And so it's like, how does it exist within the entity of our, our government? How is it stable? So that, so that resources do get distributed in an equitable way. Not saying it doesn't happen in the philanthropic you know, space, and it's not equitable there, but just if there's too much you know, potential variance there that it needs to be rooted in our city government. So where right. do you find the money within government and how do you protect that money? Again, you know, organize. It's, again, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's an $8.5 billion budget, and so you, know, you have to look carefully at the way, where you're spending money and make uh, expenditures, investments, I'll say investments, make investments based on your values. 
I want to move to one of the, uh, we took some questions from the audience uh, beforehand. I want to move to one of those from David Shizua. So I'm sorry if I'm botching it, it's Shizua. <laughs> And he, and he asks, what quantitative measures should be used to evaluate the next mayor's performance on controlling crime and violence, and how often should that measurement be calculated? In other words, how should we measure your performance quantitatively, and how often should we do it? <laughs> well, you know, the state's attorney, Kim Fox, who was my chief of staff uh, for several years before she was elected to office, uh, puts out an annual report and she talks about you know what happens to misdemeanor cases, what happens to felony cases. Um, she gives a report of the work of her office. Um, and I think that's important. I think it's important to do, you know, I would say a quarterly analysis of kind of where you are um, on these metrics. Um, having uh, spoken with the superintendent, I know we're doing much better in terms of um, murders uh, than we, year over year. Uh, so we've seen from the, from the spike in 2016, we saw a decline in 2017, we saw a decline in 2018. We're continuing to see a decline. Um, so I, that would be one measure. That would be one measure. And, and, and let me just say, um, you know, kudos, uh, kudos to the police department for that good work. But I think it also reflects the philanthropic investments. Because what the philanthropic community did was do a kind of triage. Um, you know, the, the communities in which there was the most violence, they invested most in in street interventions, you know, interrupting the cycle of violence, you know, after school programming, investments in at-risk youth. So there were kind of three uh, buckets, and the communities that were the most violent clearly got the, 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 the lion's share of the resources, but other communities that, that also experienced violence, but maybe not quite as intentionally, also got resources. And I think that's had a real impact as well, um, as well as the smaller amount of money that, that the county has been investing in, in this over the last six years. So you know, these investments in community-based organizations that know the young people uh, in their communities um, and have a good handle on, on how they can work with young people and, and help them change the arc of their life are, are organizations that we ought to be uh, funding. Alex? Yeah, so I, you, know, you had earlier talked about one of the um, things that distinguishes Chicago is the kind of profound poverty in, in many of these neighborhoods. And, and, and one of the things that's striking is that, you know, that many of these communities are still reeling from the 2008 housing crisis and the number of abandoned properties. I mean, it's, when I was working on my book, I remember one of the young men I was spending time with, and at any moment in time, there were three to six vacant homes on his block. And, and of course, communities that begin to fray like that, they become ripe terrain for the violence. And so how would you address that, especially the, the number of abandoned properties and also, I, I mean, Partnered with that, the, the need for affordable housing in the city. Um, we're losing so many people. Uh, uh, with the leadership of uh, Bridget Gaynor, uh, commissioner in the county, uh, we formed uh, the Cook County Land Bank. And the Cook County Land Bank gets properties from the, foreclosed properties from the banks, um, from the federal government. Um, they've also gone into the tax sale, the, the sale of tax delinquent properties in the county and uh, secured properties. And they have been acquiring abandoned uh, homes and then finding small developers in the community. And this has been really, um, this is not the big boys, this is small community-based developers. Um, and rehabbing those homes and then selling them at you know, reasonable prices in the communities. Uh, but let me just say, you know, the African-American and Latinx communities were especially devastated by uh, the Depression, um, you know, partly because they uh, were the subject of um, these, I can only describe it as mortgage fraud, <laughs> you know, that was perpetrated on our black and brown neighborhoods. Um, and many people lost their homes, and in many communities, as you say, there are two or three houses on a block that are boarded up. And from a real estate perspective, my understanding is for every board up house, every, fam every home on the block it loses 10% of its value. So it, it not only has the effect of, of making the community look like resources have been withdrawn from it, but it, it impacts property values on the whole block. So the Cook County Land Bank uh, has been <laughs> ramping up over the last uh, three or four years. And I think the city needs to work much more closely with the land bank. We, it's the Cook County Land Bank, and so we have as county government worked very closely with it, but the city has to work more closely too to expedite the time 
that it takes for these abandoned properties to get into the land bank and turned over to developers so that they can, um, can rehabilitate them and uh, put them back in the market. Because it, 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 these vacant buildings have a devastating effect, not just around um, potential crime, but property values more generally and, and people's investments in their home, which is the biggest investment everybody makes. Most, I'm sorry, most ordinary working people make, not everybody. I want to go back to violent crime for a moment. Uh, in your paper uh, on public safety, you describe it as a public health issue. And I, I happen to agree with that. Um, but one of the consequences of that, of the violence, especially in communities that have suffered for years, decades actually, with some of the intense violence, is the trauma that's associated. Young people, older people. Um, two part question, one, how do you coordinate services robust enough to be able to deal with this issue? Um, I, I used an example from, uh, from Philly where, you know, you had a homicide scene and you, uh, you know, the, the processing of the scene is finished, but there are children on that block um, that may not have seen what happened, but they're still exposed to it. They have to walk by that scene afterwards on the way to school. And so intervention, you know, uh, how do you contact and coordinate with schools, other mental health providers, hospitals, and, and the like. Uh, but it's not just the community that's exposed to the trauma. It's also the police officers that have to work in that environment on a regular basis. This city has had seven police officers commit suicide in the last six months. That is highly unusual. So we, how would you deal with the, the that issue, both in terms of the impact it has on community, but also taking it a step further and looking at the impact it has on uh, the, the men and women that have to deal with it on an ongoing basis. Well, let me start with um, employee assistance programs first. You know, um, in, in the change of culture that we need to see in the police department, uh, an important part of that is um, trying to deal with the stigma uh, that sometimes gets attached to, to seeking help. And you know, when I, when I talk about the jail, I say the jail is a jail for the people who are detained there and it's also a jail for the people who work there. And the violence that we see in our neighborhoods impacts community residents, family members, whatever, but it's, it also impacts the police officers who have to address uh, these crime scenes, um, I won't say every day, but very often. And we have to destigmatize getting help to deal with those challenges. Um, so it's not just, not just the people in the communities that have PSTD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but also, or syndrome, um, but also the, the police officers, so that's part of it. Um, you know, <coughs> former state senator, now um, Attorney General Kwame Raoul, um, pushed for a long time to change the way in which we looked at victim assistance. Because the state money that came to uh, victim assistance programs had pretty much been um, demarked for victims of domestic violence. Um, and his point was that we have lots of victims of violence, not necessarily domestic violence, but community, uh, intra-community, communal violence, and that we need to have, what he was trying to do is, is create victim assistance centers in the state to, to help address the community trauma that goes along with uh, the tremendous violence that many of our neighborhoods face, and I think that's a good idea. Um, I will tell you that in our uh, county care program, which is our Medicaid uh, expansion program, um, for which we're grateful to President Obama, it's one of the moving parts of the Affordable Care Act, uh, we included in the, the services that we provide uh, to our patients behavioral health services, substance abuse and addiction services, because we knew that there was a great need for those and the county health system hadn't had a very big footprint in that arena previously. So we have been investing money in our um, Medicaid expansion program and behavioral health services and part of the behavioral health service needs, of course, are, are addressing trauma in our communities. But, you know, when I think back of my own, my own experience it's at, at when my student was murdered, um, unfortunately that was a time in which uh, no one even thought about uh, dealing with the emotional trauma that all of us um, shared um, when, when, our, when our student was murdered. 
And fortunately now that the school system has some supports, for example, when, when young people face these traumas in their community, but it's not enough. And I, I like the idea of victim assistance centers, and I hope that the Attorney General will continue to try to secure state support for those kind of um, community-based centers that help us deal with, with uh, prevalent trauma in our communities. Liz. So one of the things that always struck me uh, as, a, as a school principal um, over six years, we buried, um, unfortunately, uh, dozens of young men. And you know, I went to every single funeral. And what, what, what you know, is in the back of my mind always, and if you've ever been to the funeral of a young person, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's this soul-wrenching cry of the mothers, and it's the same across every single mother. You can, it's like you can almost like feel it and experience it in your own, your own gut. And so I'm just curious, as you think about violence that's happening in our communities, as you talk about the victims assistance centers, are you saying that for um, people in communities who you know, have this experience of violence, whether it be that mother or um, other people in the community, they would go to the victims assistance centers, one, and then two, as we think about the residual trauma, so there's the, you know, the direct victims and the, the, the families, there's also everybody else in the community. And I think Chicago Public Schools obviously has the biggest kind of bulk of, of, of young people in our city in terms of one entity. How do we think about like, the, those tier one support? So th for those kids who aren't exhibiting you know, the biggest, they're not you know, necessarily fighting and they're not you know, exhibiting trauma by being depressed, but there's, there's the kind of the undercurrent right, of, the, of that. Uh, victim of trauma, how, how does that get addressed system-wide? Uh, and, and I might also add, how do we get more social workers and school psychologists yeah. into our schools who are so essential to dealing with all the burdens that these kids bring into that school building every day? And not to prolong it, but when, when, there's, a mass, <laughs> when there's a mass shooting in a school, all these resources get poured in, and you see it. And I'm not saying they don't need that, but we have kids here that are experiencing trauma every single day, and there's no resource inside that school to deal with. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be funny to add on to it, but I want to add on to it, <laughs> is, um, and you were a teacher too, so you get this, like, there's also like this second and third hand trauma of like the teachers who are supposed to be supporting the kids, and like, so it's this big kind of Rubik's Cube, if you will, where do, where do we go with that? What do we, what do, we do? What can, as, out of the mayor's office, like what can be done with all of our questions? <laughs> were, you, were, you, were you tracking all of that? <laughs> go ahead, Tony. One of the toughest things for me as alderman, and I was alderman for almost 20 years, was going to the funerals of young people. Mm -hmm. So what they don't tell you uh, when you're an elected official is um, that you go to a lot more funerals than ordinary folks because it's not just your family and your friends, but all the people that you and your office touch. And you get a call that says somebody's aunt died or whatever. But the most wrenching calls, as you know, are the calls that um, involve a young person being uh, shot and killed. Um, and I went to more of those funerals than I care to remember. And uh, particularly because I was a teacher, you know, and I spent so much time with young people it was always just devastating. And as you say, um, the mothers and the other family members, it's just, uh, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. So what are your, what are your strategies, is, what would your strategies be as mayor, other than being a leader and comforting those mothers in terms of adding social workers, in terms of addressing these multi-layered challenges that Liz well, mentioned? Well, as Liz knows, there's a, the present funding formula for our schools is pretty much per capita. Uh, it's per student, right? Uh, but the fact is that, that we have schools that have greater needs than others. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a teacher. I believe in the importance of great teachers. But I know that many of our schools need bilingual support. They need social workers. They need psychologists. Um, in order to provide the wraparound services that our kids need in order to do well in school. You know, I don't know how you're going to do well in algebra when somebody got shot and killed on your block last night. You know what I mean? Um, so one of the things we have to do is allocate resources differently to our schools to be sure that there's, there's need-based criteria as well as per capita allocations. And, and that's, that's a real challenge that we have to address. Um, 
Is that something that can be done uh, by CPS without, within shifting resources to the CPS or city hall budget, or is that something well, I think, that has to be legislated? I think, um, I, having talked to people in the public schools, I think some of that is being done already. I think it needs to be, um, accelerated isn't the word I want to use, it needs to be intensified. Um, and and I, I, I don't mean to demean the, uh, the trauma of adults in any way, but I think it's particularly important that we focus on our young people and the, the trauma that they face. And the families, of course, of the victims. Um, I just wanted to piggyback, this is really important. I, think, I, I totally agree with you on, on the ch children's point of view. This, I mean, as, as a teacher, as a principal, 100%. But the, those adults are the ones that are servicing those young people. And right. so if they're not right, then the kids aren't right. And so I just don't want to, yeah, I, no, I know no. you don't mean that, but just no, to. And, and this employee assistance idea, you know, um, <coughs> the school personnel needs that help and support too. Um, if you're, if you're dealing every day with, with traumatized kids, that has an impact on you. And we need to be sure that the adults have the, have the emotional supports, the social supports that they need to be able to do that difficult work. We have to wrap up now and would just like to ask if you have any final uh, reflections, particularly around this conversation and what you've learned, what you've gleaned from this illustrious panel of experts that you will take back with you and that, in what ways might that impact your vision as mayor and any, anything else you'd like to add? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Liz, who uh, was both a teacher and a principal. Um, this is very hard work, folks. <laughs> um, and it's a lot harder than I was when I was in the classroom 30 years ago. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult and important work. And I was talking earlier today uh, to a group of folks that were focused on immigration. I would, would turn down, would turn, the conversation turned to our public schools. And it's not just because I'm a teacher, but you know, we live in a country that doesn't really value our young people. If we valued our young people, we would keep our schools open from you know, seven in the morning till seven or eight at night. We'd be sure that every kid had breakfast and lunch and dinner at school. We would have before school and after school activities for our kids. We would have both group counseling and individual counseling and supports available to our, to our children in our schools. And by the way, when I say we should feed everybody, there should no, be no stigmatizing people who have low incomes. We should just feed everybody. Because we don't want anybody to feel demeaned by the fact that they have a free lunch or a free breakfast. We should just feed everybody. And you have to understand that most juvenile crime is committed between four and seven. What's between four and seven? A time when school's out and your parents get home. So if we want to have an impact on uh, you know, what, an idle mind or idle hands or a devil's workshop, if we want to have an impact on safety, one of the things we can do is invest more in our schools, particularly in after school programming. And you know, for a lot of our communities, not just here in the city, but in the suburbs, parents who are privileged pay for music lessons or you know, soccer or whatever for their kids. But in, in many of our communities where the parents don't have those resources and the kids don't have those opportunities, they're kind of at loose ends at sixes and sevens between you know, that four and seven hour. Um, so one of the things we need to do is invest more in our, in our public schools as an investment in our young people and an investment in, in, in diminishing violence. Um, and I say that not just because, as I said, I'm a teacher, but because I've spent um, most of my adult life in public service, and I've seen the consequences of not investing in our children. Um, you know, education is an escalator, and we live in a country in which we allow, we allow children who are the most challenged to have the least spent on them, and children who are the most privileged to have the most spent on them in their public schools. Um, so I, that's not, I suppose, <laughs> what you expected to hear at the end of this. <laughs> at the end of this, but you know, we have some real challenges as a country, and the foundation of those challenges is our unwillingness to invest the resources that we need to invest in our young people. Um, from you know, early childhood education uh, all the way up through high school and of course, of course beyond. The, 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 challenge, the challenge after high school post-secondary education is that we put so much burden on individuals and their families to pay for their college educations when an educated, uh, citizenry and workforces benefits all of us, and, and that's a different challenge, which Bernie Sanders and others have addressed, but um, 
you know, from, from my perspective, we have to invest in our communities. I always talk about investing in our public schools, investing in housing development, supporting small businesses. We have to support our small and medium-sized businesses in our communities because they're the ones that employ people in the community. Um, and we also have to address the challenge of, of public safety. Thank you, Madam President, for this very stimulating and important conversation. Thanks to our panel. I know you've got to, I know you've got to get back on the Kent campaign trail, so you're, you're free to go. Thank you. <laughs> and I want to ask you all to hold on because we're going to have a, a brief closing conversation in just a moment. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. We just want to take a, before, before you dash, we just want to take a few minutes to ask the panel to reflect on what you've heard. Uh, I'd love to hear your takeaways. Uh, you had a lot of good, tough questions that we didn't get to all of them, but what's, what's your takeaways, Alex, uh, in terms of what you heard and what you didn't hear or wanted to hear more of? Well, I gotta say this is, I think, a, a remarkable moment in our city's history that we have two candidates like Tony Perkwinkle and Lori Lightfoot running for mayor, both of whom I think see so clearly, I mean, I think they both operate out of a, a, a kind of fundamental premise that life ought to be fair and just, and, um, and it seemed to me that so much of what they talked about today had to do with that. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that both of them, when we began their sessions, they both sort of right away went into talking about the police and the fraught relations between the police and communities of color, which are, needless to say, I mean, is on the absolute front burner where it should be. But I do think we sometimes make the mistake of thinking of the violence as simply a problem of the police. And that we've got to, and I was glad to see that in the conversation that we, both Tony and Lori were able to sort of expand that conversation to talk about community, to talk about schools, to talk about trauma. I mean, there's, there's a, not to sound too Jerry Brownish, but we've got to be much more holistic about the way we think about the violence. Charles? Uh, first of all, I was impressed by both of the uh, candidates. Um, it's not easy to have discussions like this in 40 minutes because there were a lot of areas that we weren't able to really uh, touch on. Um, but looking at violence as a public health uh, problem, I think is the right way to look at it. The challenge is how do you coordinate all the resources? How do you fund the resources that are short, quite frankly, the reason police have so much responsibility has been thrown on them in terms of dealing with people suffering from mental illness and various other things is because the agencies that are actually responsible for it, their budgets get cut on a regular basis and they don't have the personnel to be able to address it. And, uh, you know, so I understand why, you know, funding is something that really can't be answered right away because it's just, it's difficult. But you also have to find a way. And I think that comes from a real strategic plan, comprehensive plan, that has both short-term and long-term strategies to get a handle on what's going on. Because this city can never reach its full potential as long as the violence is where it is right now. Whether it's, you know, and the numbers go down slightly, but the perception around the country right now, and I don't live in Chicago anymore, so I find myself defending the city quite a bit, <laughs> is that, you know, the violence is out of control. And, I, and that's gotta turn around. That you, absolutely has turned absolutely. around. Absolutely, and you, and you mentioned this issue of coordinating services and, and getting at the root of the the problem, not just the policing aspect of it. Is there any, you, you, you travel a lot, you, you, you do a lot of consulting, is there any city that's getting this right now? Well, I, I, I hate to keep pointing to New York, but I think New York has made a lot of progress in a lot of ways. I mean, in 1992, I believe, they had 2,200 murders. Last year, they had less than 300. That wasn't just the police department. That was the entire city government. That was, that was the business community the foundation that they have created in New York City that it paid, that helped pay for some of the things. It takes a collective effort. It can't just be city government. I mean, you know, for example, you know, cut the police budget to do X, Y, Z. When I was in the Chicago Police Department, 96% of that budget was personnel cost. Yeah. Yeah. In Philadelphia, 98% 
of the budget is personnel costs. So it's easy to say cut, it's but where are you going to say cut? cut yeah. but where do you cut? And so for every cut, there's consequence. So what I'm saying is that if it's just up to government alone, it's not going to happen because you don't, you're not going to have the resources necessarily without cutting something else that's going to have unintended consequences that causes you now to have to deal with something else. Uh, so there are places that you can take a look at. There is no one place that's perfect. But it takes a sustained effort beyond administrations, beyond tenures of police chiefs and all that sort of thing. It has to continue on. But it's doable. There's no reason for Chicago to have the kinds of crime numbers that they have right now. Can I just say one quick thing about New York? Because I think you're right to point to New York's coordinated effort. But there are also two other, I think, distinct differences between New York and Chicago, which are worth pointing out are important. One is that New York is really gentrified. It's become, needless to say, an incredibly expensive city. And one of the things I hope about Chicago is that we don't go the way of New York or San Francisco and Seattle. One of the things I so value about this place is the richness and complexity of the city. Um, and the other thing, of course, which we haven't talked about, but is the availability of guns. And we're surrounded by states in which guns are incredibly easily purchased, and New York is fortunate to be surrounded by states where there are reasonably strict gun laws. And you know, the flow of guns into this city is just, it's an endless, endless supply. It's just an endless river. So. And to add in the third part is that the concentrated amounts of poverty right. that are very different in New York and Los Angeles than they are here in Chicago. And Tony Preckwinkle did, mm -hmm. did, did reference that. So what, what is your takeaway, Liz? You, you, I think, pounded away more than anyone about where are we going to find the money? How are we going to pay for this? Did you feel satisfied by the answers? Um, I was, I, I'll say what I was happy about. I, I was happy that each candidate really uh, acknowledged the fact that this is, they didn't you know, play into like, the whack-a-mole idea of like, we're just gonna kind of do these kind of one-off things here, but they really both of them, I think, double-clicked and talked to us about some of the systemic causes. And I think just the acknowledgement of the systemic causes and thinking about that as you build a solution is absolutely critical. And I think oftentimes that gets left out of, uh, left out of the equation as we think about where to go from here. Can I just add one thing, because I just want to make it clear. I mean, it was the first thing that came to my mind was New York, but I also am a native Chicagoan, so I realize we all have a second city syndrome here, too. And so we can't be afraid to look other places. I don't care if it's New I don't care where it is. Are there going to be differences? Absolutely there are going to be differences. It doesn't mean you can't pick up a little bit here and a little bit there, because we've got to do something, and the solution in my opinion, is not just in Chicago. We're going to have to reach out and figure out what works for us. We're going to have to partner with our universities because we need people to actually measure progress and success. And we got to like the crime lab here. It's like the crime lab. We got to quit throwing money away at feel good stuff that really has zero impact on the kinds of violence or whatever it's supposed to because... What, what, what would you say is an example of the field? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to be fronting folks off, but sometimes you have programs that, that people want funding for, but over four or five years, if it's not having any kind of impact, and if it is, how are you going to... You need to measure it. That ought to be part, before we give out any money, there's got to be an evaluation component attached to it to see if it's working. And if it's working, let's keep doing it, let's build on it. If it's not, let's do something a little different. I mean, we gotta be serious about this and we, and we, gotta, we gotta really make the investment. I mean, you want a better trained department, but you don't wanna spend the money to do it. You know, you want, you want more <coughs> mental health professionals, but you don't wanna spend the money to, to get them. We need to do things in the schools. You need school psychologists, social workers, and you need to pay teachers a decent salary so you get good people in these schools. And so, you know, it's complicated. There is no one answer, but we can't let elected officials get away Absolutely. with a lot of stuff, right, to get elected, and then they get in and it's the same old stuff that we've had before. It, I agree with you, Charles. I think it, it is, it's definitely complex. I agree with everything um, that you've said on, on principle. I, I, I guess my, from my perspective, like, you know, there have, we do, we do know what works. I mean, there, there are, there, what do we think about, you know, programs that have been studied or we think about what makes a healthy community, like, there, we do know what works. And so I, I don't want to make it seem like it's just nebulous, like we have no idea. Sure. I think for us as a city, it's really about the long-term sustained and funded strategy behind it. 
um, and that it doesn't, to your point, change with administrations or change with police use, that we're really, we're really doubling uh, and tripling and quadrupling down on that. Did you hear, did you hear a commitment from these candidates to well, that long-term strategy? I mean, the thing that, that actually surprised me, I didn't realize how large a public safety office there was, for example, in the city of New York. Right. And, um, and the idea, the notion that in a place like Chicago that is so racked by the violence for so many years that we don't have a comparable public safety department for me is outrageous. And so um, it was something for me that, that I learned for the first time tonight, that, that how small ours is compared to other cities. Well, and the danger with, with that, though, is that I, I agree with you 100%, and there's been call, Ron Emanuel's been pushed for many years to, to address that question. but. Then you, you also create a, a, the danger of another bureaucracy that maybe becomes sort of self-sustaining and, and it's not necessarily getting back to the whole coordination issue. Uh, it's fine to have a bunch of bodies in, in City Hall, but what, you know, what are they doing? You pulled Liz into head at that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, just one final thing, and I know we do have a lot of things that, that, that work, but we're also still sitting here talking about it. Mm -hmm. right. And so if it's working fine, but it better we'll start working better. <laughs> or we're gonna be having these forums over and over again, and it's frustrating. I grew up in Inglewood, so I grew up around that stuff. I saw my first homicide when I was 14 years old when my brother's best friend got murdered because he was not in a gang. Five years later, right at the same spot, a cop got shot in the face by gang members and killed right on the corner of where I grew up. I've been around this stuff forever. I'm 69 years old. I mean, how long are we gonna go on thinking that there's some magic formula that's gonna somehow fix this. Folks, everybody in this room has a responsibility to help fix Chicago. It's not just the city. And until you ask yourself, what am I doing to make this a better city? I don't care if you're a resident, a student, or whatever. This is a great city, and we should not be sitting here having these kinds of conversations about crime, violence, homicide, and all this nonsense that we have going on in our city. This city is more than capable of fixing it, but can't do it alone. Well said. And this is day one. This is the moment where we're going to start. Thanks to our fabulous panel, Chuck, Chuck Ramsey, Alice Kotlowitz, and Ms. Dozier. Thank you for all you do. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Wonderful.